Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem and today we'll talk about modes in the 16th and 17th centuries. We all know that before things came down to merely two different kinds of scales, the major scale and the minor scale, there were different kinds of modes. In the spirit of the scientific renaissance thinking, many theorists try to make sense and explain the modes. Often torn between medieval and Greek theories, they invented new ways of naming and recognizing the modes. However, the final outcome of all these theories together was already in old times considered as a complete mess. In this episode, we'll try to put some order in the subject and see what we can nevertheless learn from the modes. Modes, first mentioned in the 9th century, were originally a way of grouping and categorizing Gregorian chants. Modes are made of specific sequences of notes, as opposed to the way that we think nowadays on scales, as octaves, the modes are formed by sequences of five notes and of four notes, called also species of fifths and of fourths. Within the diatonic system, there are only so many acceptable variants for these sequences, that is, variants in which the perfect fourths and fifths can be ordered in successions of whole steps and half steps. If we take the various species of fifths and place the various species of fourths above them, we get the four authentic modes, one on D, also called Dorian, one on E, Phrygian, one on F, Lydian, and one on G, Mixolydian. The first note at the bottom of the species of fifth is also called the finalis of the mode, as it is normally the note on which the piece ends. Now, if we put the species of fourths below the species of fifths, we get the four plagal modes, Hypodorian, Hypophrygian, Hypolydian, and Hypomixolydian. These eight groupings, which are based on the four different finalis notes, D, E, F, and G, are the famous eight modes. So, we have eight modes. But aren't there actually 12 modes? Well, it depends whom you ask. Let's see. As we saw, the eight modes are based on four different finalis notes, D, E, F, and G. Glareanus, however, in his 1547 book called Dodecacordon, suggested that there were actually more modes if we considered two more finalis notes, namely A and C. A mode on B was still out of the question, since its fifth degree is a diminished interval. So based on the finalis A, we have the Aeolian mode with its authentic and plagal versions. And based on the finale C, we have the Ionian mode, of course also with its authentic and plagal versions. With these four new modes, we have a total of 12 modes. This set of 12 modes was accepted by many, most famously by Zarlino, who presented it in his influential 1558 book Istituzioni Armoniche. However, some years later, Zarlino decided to renumber the 12 modes, having the first mode start on the finalis C, so that which was previously the 11th mode with the Greek name Ionian now became the first mode with the Greek name Dorian. Whatever reasons he had for that renumbering, it ended up being simply too confusing. And although this numbering was adopted by some, on the whole, it just added another level of difficulty to a subject already full of controversies. The modes were originally invented and employed in the context of monodic chant. How then the modes were explained in the 16th century, when polyphony was so central in music? Applying the theory of modes to polyphony was not simple, but the theorists of the Renaissance loved these kinds of challenges. Here we are again with the famous Zarlino. He suggested that the mode of a polyphonic piece is defined in accordance with its tenor voice. If the tenor voice is in the first mode, for example, the whole piece is then considered to be in the first mode. 
However, since in polyphony voices have overlapping ranges, if the tenor is in an authentic mode, the bass would be plagal, and the canto and alto will be equivalent to the tenor and bass just an octave higher. In contrast, if the tenor were in a plagal mode, the other voices would be adjusted accordingly. This is a good time to mention that when a range of a mode is not comfortable, that is too low or too high, there is always the possibility of transposition. In this case, for example, we have the plagal version of the Dorian mode, the Hypodorian, or the second mode, and we see that it is way too low and out of the comfortable vocal ranges described by theorists. Transposition in the Renaissance is a rather uncomplicated procedure. It consists of simply adding a flat to the key, and this will take the music a fourth higher or a fifth lower. In practice, the second mode is almost always transposed in that manner, since, as you saw, its untransposed version is simply too low. This is an important concept, namely that the musical system can theoretically be either untransposed, cantus durus, or, with the help of one flat, transposed, cantus mollis. Transpositions as we know them, with all the different accidentals, did take place in practice throughout the 16th century, but it was not until the middle of the 17th century that they began appearing in written out compositions. Until now, we saw that the mode contains the finalis of a piece, what we now call the key of the piece, as well as its general range. Modes, however, may be also manifested by other characteristics, such as the degrees on which cadences will be made, the way imitations or fugal entrances should be composed, and lastly, by their effects or ethos. Let's see. Cadences mark important structural moments in a piece, and the degrees of the mode on which cadences take place have an important role in making the piece modally coherent. For each mode, theorists supplied a list of cadence points according to their importance. The first point, often called the first cadence, is on the actual note of the mode, its finalis. The secondary cadence is very often a fifth above the main note of the mode. And the next cadence point, the third cadence, is often on the third degree of the mode. Some modes, however, are often treated differently. The third and fourth modes, for example, the Phrygian modes, are exceptional in their form. Even if one would try to normalize all the theory of the modes into only major and minor modes, the Phrygian modes would still need their own category. In any case, the secondary cadences of the third and fourth modes are, according to some theorists, on C and A respectively. According to other theorists, however, the cadences are on the fifth degree of the mode, like in most modes. The cadence points are not consistent among theorists. Some theorists even mention the use of peregrine cadences, cadences which are not typical for the mode. Dressler, for example, wrote that such cadences might disturb the sense of hearing when they are used unseasonably, and therefore recommended to beginner composers to avoid them. But by saying that, he actually implies that employed carefully, it is possible to use whatever cadence you want. And by saying that, he made the theory of modes a bit weaker and less coherent than it already is. On the basis that authentic modes are built with a species of fifth and then fourth, and plagal modes are built with a species of fourth and then fifth, Diruta gives help in composing or improvising imitations. If we are in an authentic mode, for example, the subject should emphasize the range of the species of fifth, like so. But then, its answer, often made by the plagal neighboring voice, would be transformed and adapted to the species of fourth like this.
You will find some nice polyphonic examples of this in the footnote. When composing a piece, the first task of a composer is to choose in which mode the composition will be. He is expected to do so according to the text and desired effect of the piece, and when relevant, according to the liturgical context. Theorists supplied us with information concerning what effect is appropriate for each mode, but of course the opinions are rather varied. However, there are some things that repeat rather often. For example, the second, fourth and sixth modes, all plagal modes, are often referred to as appropriate for said texts because they are lower than their authentic counterparts. Specifically, the second mode is almost always transposed higher, but then it has a flat, which gives another reason to categorize it in a more sad or soft class. Another rather consistent point is the description of the third mode as suitable for harsh and angry texts. This might be because this mode is based on the note Mi, which is considered hard and harsh in Renaissance terms. However, some theoreticians wrote that this mode, as well as the fourth mode, are appropriate for mournful subjects and lamentations. In the case of the Lydian mode, there are extreme inconsistencies. Some wrote that this mode is pleasant and lively, while others wrote that it is severe, hard and threatening. These kinds of inconsistencies might be explained by the fact that different writers were referring to different mode theories. But all in all, this kind of confusion is very familiar for those who are interested in modes, back then and today. The theories we have presented up until now are either from the 16th century or later, but based on the influential 16th century sources such as Glaran or Zarlino. While these theories were still circulating in the 17th century, a new trend in mode theory started to emerge. Let's see. From the beginning of the 17th century, writers presented systems of eight different tuoni, tones or tonalities which were based on the sound tones and their usual transpositions. They were similar to the traditional eight modes, but with some apparent differences. Most noticeably, one no longer made a distinction between authentic and plagal modes. One of the early examples of this is found in Banchieri's 1605, L'Organo Suonarino. Let's point out some details. The first mode is on D, as it used to be. The second mode is by now officially transposed to G with a flat. The third mode is on A, like the missing Aeolian 9th and 10th modes Glarian added. The fourth mode is on E, as it used to be. The fifth mode is now on C, but the sixth mode is still on F, where it used to be, but with a flat. Both modes seem now like the 11th and 12th Ionian modes Glarian added or in modern eyes, a standard major key. The seventh mode is on D with a flat, which makes another Aeolian mode, and the eighth mode is on G, as it used to be. Excluding the seventh mode, that according to some writers later in the century got a sharp and turned from a minor mode to a major mode, this set of tuoni is found in treatises throughout the century. The problem with the history of the modes is that it's not linear. It didn't just go from one theory to the next. Different theories were invented and used, coexisting along with older theories. Here is a very short summary. The eight modes and the sound tones, which are not at all the same thing, were established back in the Middle Ages. In 1547, Glaran extended the system of eight modes and added four new modes. His theory was accepted by many, including the famous Zarlino, who then decided to confusingly renumber the new system of 12 modes. While all these theories were still circulating, a new system of 8 modes came about. This system was based on the sound tones, which are not modes, but mere melodic formulas. Many writers disregarded this nuance, which added another layer of confusion. 
During the 17th century, writers complained that it's impossible to study the modes due to their messy literature. Already in 1622, Camillo Angleria wrote, Many have written about the formation and recognition of the modes, but one is confusingly different from another, and for this reason, many cannot perceive in what mode a composition might be when seeing it, and much less when only hearing it. Towards the end of the 17th century, writers such as Christopher Simpson and the famous Marc Antoine Charpentier are suggesting that in fact there are only two modes, a major one and a minor one. This is more or less the end of the Renaissance model theories and the beginning of the major and minor era that has continued on until today. Now you know why you never really understood modes because no one did. Many tried, but in fact, just added new layers of confusion. However, so you won't feel as if you wasted your time watching this presentation, let's try and see what we can nevertheless learn from the modes when reading and performing music from the Renaissance. The mode of a piece as the container of the piece may tell us things about the piece before even reading it. But since the modal theories are incoherent, when we look at a piece, we should try and understand how the specific composer of that piece saw the modes, on what finalis the mode is based, where he believed that the cadences should be normally, and at what points he decided to step out from the norm, and why he chose that specific mode over other modes to enable him to express the text with the right effects. By understanding a little bit more of the composer's thinking, we may better understand the composition, and by that, hopefully, we would be able to achieve a better performance. So this was our show about modes, we hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. Feel free to comment, share and like, see you next time at earlymusicsources.com.